particularly dry in the south, remaining very showery across New Zealand, particularly South Island. So heavy downpours around for Wellington through Sunday and on in towards Monday. Some thunderstorms around for Canberra, but a lot of dry weather, I think, for Cairns. The Business of Giving, in association with Prudential. The Philippines is 7,000 islands and the growth in the Philippines has not been inclusive and my, my passion is to be able to preserve the amazing gorgeousness that is in the country. You have 48 estuaries that are feeding into the river and I would say all of them are dirty and toxic. So we have to uh, initiate a major cleanup. We're seeing people's lives improve. Um, there is a palpable feeling of joy. Also, the awareness that with wealth comes a significant degree of responsibility. And the fact of giving will create a much, much nicer world to live in. The Business of Giving, in association with Prudential. Join me, Caroline Hawley, for Firing Line as we look at the field of international nominees in the 2014 Rory Peck Awards, which pay tribute to the skill, determination and bravery of freelance news cameramen and women. As the international effort to control the Ebola outbreak in parts of West Africa continues, we bring you breaking news and expert analysis as it happens. Stay up to date with our exclusive Ebola Daily Roundup program available on TV and online at bbc.com slash Ebola. Six months on from a coup d'etat, Thailand's economy is struggling. Hard at sectors like tourism raise the question, what is the future for a country still under martial law? To find out, join me, Linda Yu, for a special talking business from Thailand on BBC World News. Hello there, you're watching BBC World News. I'm Babita Sharma. The headlines this hour. Pope Francis is in Turkey for a three-day visit aimed at promoting dialogue between different faiths and cultures. He said the international community has an obligation to help Turkey cope with the increase of refugees coming in from Syria. There has been an explosion at one of the biggest mosques, mosques in Kano, northern Nigeria. Witnesses said that it was a bomb and that it caused many casualties. One report said there were three blasts. Many people are reported to have died. Britain's Prime Minister David Cameron has set out radical proposals aimed at reducing migration from the European Union. Among these measures, EU migrants coming to the UK would not be able to claim some benefits for four years. French President Francois Hollande has arrived in Guinea, the first non-African leader to visit one of the three countries hit by Ebola. You're watching BBC World News. Talking Business is sponsored by ANZ. We live in your world. Six months on from a coup d'etat, Thailand's economy is struggling. Hard-hit sectors like tourism raise the question, what is the future for Southeast Asia's second biggest economy still under martial law? To find out, I'm Linda Yu, here in Thailand, and we're Talking Business. Warm welcome to the program. Six months ago, the Thai government was overthrown in a coup d'etat. The military government has just announced that martial law will be in place indefinitely. Yet, the stock market hasn't plummeted and there's been no widespread panic. But could that change? Well, it's the 12th coup since the end of absolute monarchy in 1932. 
the previous one occurred just eight years ago. Although there has been violence, the country hasn't descended into civil war. One of the reasons it seems is that the Thai king serves as a stabilizing influence. It may be surprising that despite the frequency of coups, Thailand has been one of the fastest growing emerging economies. It's even been dubbed the Detroit of Asia for its dominant auto industry. But its economy is now struggling. So will businesses remain so sanguine about the politics? To find out what the government's long-term plans are, I sat down with So Mai Fossi, Thailand's finance minister. We have to bring up uh, the delay projects, try to boost the delay projects. We try to bring extra money from some loan programs and we reallocate. We have to uh, give more uh, additional income to farmers all over the country. That would worth about 40 billion baht. How much of an issue is ongoing political uncertainty in terms of the economy's ability to recover? How much is too much? I would say, I don't know, it's so much for, for our country. Uh, you, you cannot imagine, you know, when the government has no office to run, <laughs> has no has, uh, we, you know, so the private sector has nothing to do. In terms of the uh, return to democracy, that's something that um, I have certainly heard uh, businesses say they would like to see a transition back to a democratically elected government. When could we see that? As announced by the Prime Minister, it would take about one year. But from my my. Uh, feeling, I think uh, it may take maybe a year and a half. We discussed, and you know, just last week. Mm. But I'm, I'm, I'm very, uh, very uh, uh, confident that we will be uh, successful. Uh, and the prime minister said, "I would like to complete my, my, my work." Okay, I'm tired, as you must know. I'm tired, but I want to see everything. Uh, okay at the end and I don't want to see the own situation come back again you know the situation turmoil so on so forth mm. so it's very serious I think one thing that has caused some businesses to be concerned is that martial law doesn't have an end date why not lift martial law sooner this question should go to the Prime Minister <laughs> But as I heard from him, something that he needs as a, his uh, uh, tool, his tool to deal with uh, security. He and his group is the one who knows what something still not coming to normal, not back to normal. I don't like martial law either. <laughs> when do you think the Thai economy could get back to the growth rates that it had before last year? You can see, I think, in the second quarter of, of, of next year. Even the first quarter, I think you can see something. But in the second quarter, it would be clear. I don't hope, but I am quite sure that we would reach, we would get the growth of, uh, the growth of uh, 4 to 5 percent in uh, ne the next year. That was so my fussy. Thailand's economy is stagnating. Its trade surplus has become a deficit. Neighboring countries have issued travel warnings against going to Thailand, a popular tourist and manufacturing hub. I went to find out how well an economy can operate under martial law. It's hard to tell that Thailand had a coup d'etat just six months ago. These holiday goers don't seem faced by the imposition of martial law. A year ago, there would have been 20% more people on this beach. The decline in tourism is one of the reasons why the Thai economy is stagnating. The bigger question is, could the coup have a lasting economic impact? What's most at risk is not the resorts. Dubbed the Detroit of Asia, it's factories like this Ford plant on the outskirts of Bangkok that's at the heart of Thailand's success. Attracting foreign expertise but doing the work themselves 
is how Thailand built its industries and raised incomes. But car sales have fallen even more than tourism since the coup. This factory can produce 150,000 of these cars every year. Thailand needs businesses like this one to continue to invest in its manufacturing sector. But there's competition from neighboring countries hot on its heels. The advantage Thailand has is the supply chain, the scale, the logistics, and, and, and the cost or the wages. In 15 years head start, uh, ahead of many of the other countries in ASEAN or Southeast Asia. So with the investment that uh, major manufacturers have here, it's tough to just take that investment and put it in, in other countries. There are certainly other countries, uh, Indonesia specifically, who are also attracting investment. But how have ordinary people in Thailand been affected by the coup? How have small businesses fared since martial law was imposed and seems will last indefinitely? I've come to meet a small business owner whose company rents out vans. Hi, James. Hi, Good to see you. Good to see you, too. So tell me, what has been your biggest worry since the coup? James took over the family firm from his father, who ran it for 25 years. I asked him how business has been since the military came to power. Um, it's getting worse. Uh, my customers come to Thailand less, so because of the concern about the situations in Thailand or about the violence uh, in, in Thailand. Curiously, Thailand has grown relatively well in spite of 12 coups since 1932. But it's now forecast to be the laggard in the region. If businesses leave for more stable cities than Bangkok, these traffic jams could soon be missed. Later in the program, we hear from the chief executive of one of Thailand's largest companies about how businesses are coping with the political uncertainty. Can I help you? You know what this guy's problem is? What? He's so busy planning and building things for his customers that he's overlooking his most important project. Which is? His life. Planning and building his own business. Maybe he needs to talk to someone. He just needs to take the first step. ANZ has specialists with the expertise to help build your business today and plan for tomorrow. We insisted that it looked like a handmade film. The problem is it would have cost tens of millions of dollars in Lego bricks alone. We were going to need to do a lot of it in CGI. You are right. Some of the backgrounds and some little pieces were actual Lego things that were photographed and comped into the scene. We kept saying it's going to be spectacular that it looks like real miniature photography. <laughs> Numerous questions remain over Thailand's future. How much will martial law impact the growth of its businesses? Will Thailand still play a leading role in the formation of a Southeast Asian free trade area? To find out, I sat down with the chief executive of one of Thailand's largest companies, Siam Cement, which is effectively controlled by the royal family. I asked Kontra Kun about how business has changed since the coup. After the demonstration, we already felt it, all right, in November, December. So by that time, actually, I asked my management okay, to start to export more of our products. And we have seen the, the demand of the uh, cement, building materials, paper drop. Even the chemical business also have some effect. You say you expect political stability to be restore, restored soon. Uh, what do you mean by that? Definitely we will have to go for the election, okay? Hopefully, I believe maybe uh, next year, uh, by, by, by uh, middle or by uh, at latest maybe year end, okay? That I, I would expect, okay? And by that time, okay, we, we return back to the full democracy again, okay? 
But the most important thing is, is the mindset of the business circles. I would say in my 37 years with the company, I faced uh, many coups already, right? Our business partners, okay. Uh, so this is a business uh, going as usual. I think one thing that always puzzles people when they look at uh, businesses like yours, and obviously uh, your business was founded by the royal family, has very deep roots in Thailand. You've yourself said you faced a lot of coups. It's something that people from outside Thailand may not understand. How would you explain that mindset? I think not only uh, our company, not only SEG, okay? I think most of the company in Thailand, and uh, most of the, our friends uh, from Japan, from the U.S., from Europe, every, everybody is the same, you know, with the same situation. But one thing, maybe uh, the government might, be, might not be happy if I say this, okay? You see, in the past, okay, I would say the business uh, uh, in Thailand, all the business people, the government uh, have not support, I would say, supported the business so much, okay? I have to say this. This is true, I believe. So all the business people have to to work hard, okay, struggle, and pass through all the difficulties by themselves. You can compare with the Singaporean government, okay, or Malaysian. Your government so good, okay, <laughs> and help the business, okay. But in in Thailand, no. Okay? Because the government also changed quite often, even with the democratic election, you know, a few years change, something like that. So, so the long-term policy by the government uh, quite difficult to be established. So that's why we have to uh, to work hard, okay, to fight, to uh, to face a competition, most likely by ourselves. So that's why what happened. Uh, to the, the government is really almost no effect to us, okay? Some effect, yes, okay, but, but not much, not too much. That was Contra Kun. One of the key questions about Thailand's future is whether a military government has the capacity to address long-term challenges such as education. Our Southeast Asia correspondent, Jonathan Head, went to find out. For the titans of Thailand's industry, the post-coup calm has been a relief. Here at the stock market trade show, they're selling investors a tale of more promising performance next year. And yet the economy is still stalled, shackled by political uncertainty. So where is the man who seized power six months ago taking his country? General Prayut has a capable economic team, but the last word on policy belongs to him alone. And until now, it's hard to discern a clear long-term vision. I think they have been dealing more with the uh, short-term uh, urgent matters that require their uh, attention. Uh, what I'm more concerned is that uh, the long-term economic perspective. Thailand have had uh, a lot of opportunity loss from the, the past decade of our political uh, instability, and this opportunity loss are becoming more and more costly because we are not the only one in this region that can attract all the foreign investment. There are several threats to Thailand's economic future, none greater than the weakness of its education system. Educational and skills reform are absolutely critical in Thailand. There is no country in the world that has achieved advanced income country status without massive and sustained investments in good education, in good skills. This is something the current government recognizes, as have past governments. Nonetheless, Thailand has so far not done much in this area. But far from looking forward, in the first of his weekly television addresses, General Prayut harked back to the values of the past. Saying he wanted traditional Thai virtues like patriotism and respect for the monarchy drummed into school pupils. From the very start, his government has stamped out dissenting views, insisting that debate is too divisive. And that has led to some bizarre censorship. 
This grand old cinema is an unlikely setting for political unrest. Yet today, they've had to cancel the premiere of a major movie for fear of protests. And that tells you just how jittery this government still is about its lack of legitimacy and how easily distracted it is by relatively minor events. A lone student activist turned up to explain what they would have done had the premiere of The Hunger Games Part 3 gone ahead, a film which has inspired their defiance of military rule. That was enough to get him detained. As was bringing this book out, just briefly, for journalists to see. This is not the first time he's been arrested. It probably won't be the last. Frustration over the military's tight hold on power is rising. More people are questioning its competence. Thailand is far from being normal, as far as it is still being ruled by martial law, a junta group that refused to be accountable in any way. This is not a normal country. It is a dictatorship. It is a military state. General Prayut is now struggling on many fronts. Internationally, he's found himself marginalized for seizing power. At home, his rigid conservative rule is losing public support. Jonathan Head, BBC News, Bangkok. In spite of protests, we learned from the finance minister that elections could be delayed and may not take place until 2016. I went to see Vera Ali, a lecturer at Temasek University, to discuss how political uncertainty could affect Thailand's prospects. Hello, Vera. Good to see you. So just on that question, how will political uncertainty affect Thailand's long-term prospects? Uh, a lot, actually, because I think uh, while at the surface it, feel, it seems that everything is quite calm at the moment, but actually things are brawling within it. Is it an issue that the elections won't happen now until the end of 2015? I think it will even go further than that. It will go into 2016 or even more, because the interim constitution has clearly stated that uh, the head of the NCPO has the power uh, to at least Let's say if he's not happy with the outcome of the constitution, he could always disband it and come up with a new one. So, so the that's... reform is dependent on his particular decision. The other issue, whenever you see protests which are still happening and you still see the military presence on the streets, could there be civil unrest like what we saw in 2010, a few years after the last coup? A large scale would be something, not a possibility at the moment, as we saw in 2010. But there would be kind of a spotty, sprawling uh, movements here and there. But to get what we call, to sort that out is very simple. Allow people to get more involved in the political process. That would calm everything down. And we will see a better type of a reform as well. I think that's the only way out that we could, you know, take everyone in the society along with the reform process. In fact, one of the um, issues for the economy is that any time you have a military coup d'etat, you have a military government in place, you have martial law that's being declared to be, well, not going to be lifted anytime soon, could that set the economy back? It could be, it could be. Uh, as we've seen since 2006, every coup we have, if you look at the long-term economic data, we will see that there's always a recession after a coup. Before, in the 80s, China was not as large as we understand them now. Now they are the big superpower in the region. Uh, they're an economic power as well. On the other hand, countries like Burma, Myanmar, countries like Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, or even Indonesia was not a match for an economic competition for Thailand. But now, while we are kind of uh, inter interested in our own internal problems, those countries are actually developing and what you call uh, creating that competitiveness. So now the old ways of using coups, old ways of thinking that technocrats would be able to run the country might not be a kind of a sound answer in the new environment. That was Vero Ali. So far investors have been sanguine about Thailand. But will it remain an attractive place for foreign companies to put their money? I sat down with Mark Spiegel, vice chairman of the Joint Foreign Chambers of Commerce that represents companies from 30 countries in Thailand, to find out if foreign investors could pull out. Thailand seems to have the nickname Teflon Thailand. I mean, if you look at how many coups they've had since 1931 when they had their first constitution, it's been quite a lot. But Thailand seems to have the ability to bounce back even stronger each time. 
Um, I think it's a little bit different this time because of the fact that we have the AEC integration coming. Uh, you have China putting so much pressure on the entire region for access and better integration. Uh, it's a little bit different than it was in the past. President Obama has obviously said that Thailand needs to restore democracy as soon as possible. This has been reported. Um, one of the conversations that he's had while in his Asia tour. Um, is there a sense that foreign investors could leave the country if democracy is not restored uh, quickly or as promised? Well, I think we have to separate the business people from the diplomats. <laughs> Obviously, they tend to take a different approach in how they negotiate with government. I mean, clearly, political stability and stability in general in any country where a foreign company is going to invest is, is very important. Um, however, if you look at the track record of the foreign investors that are here and the length of time that they're here, to see a mass exodus, I would highly doubt it. Um, but obviously, people that are considering new investment or initial investment into Thailand may consider going somewhere else um, if, if some of the long-ranging plans that Thailand wants to accomplish do, do not come to fruition. You're the umbrella organization for foreign businesses in yes, Thailand. Yes, we are. What are some of the concerns that you're hearing that could cause uh, foreign businesses to stay away? Well, clearly, as we talked about earlier, I mean, we need to liberalize the services sector. I mean, studies have shown from World Bank and ADB and others that this is what helps unlock an economy, and Thailand is very close to heading into the middle income trap. Uh, we feel that this is a way out of it. Uh, we also see that, obviously, skilled labor becomes an issue. Um, as, as the indigenous population want to move up the food chain, if you will, in terms of, of uh, business opportunities, we need intense skill training. We need an increase of skill from foreign labor, at least for a short term, in, in order to handle some knowledge transfer uh, and prepare them for what's next. What about political risk? Political risk. There's always political risk. But I think those that are here for the long term and have been here a long time, they've learned to ride the roller coaster. That was Mark Spiegel. Thailand has had the most coups of any country in the world. Yet, it has grown well despite of it. However, six months on from the latest coup d'etat, there are worrying signs. Ultimately, a country cannot flourish under martial law. Just imagine Thailand's economic potential if it didn't have such political uncertainty. That's all we have time for. Check out our website and me on Twitter. I'm at Linda Yu. And join us next time for more Talking Business with me, Linda Yu. Talking Business is sponsored by ANZ. We live in your world. When you're in the middle of everything, it can be hard to see it all clearly. It all works together. But when you rise above it and see it all laid out, it's so much easier to know exactly where you are. ANZ specialists across Asia Pacific can provide you with a comprehensive view and the expertise to help your business progress. Ooh, high finance indeed.